learning how to fly Cessnas, or in many cases, not flying Cessnas. One of their instructors said I was surprised they could drive a car. And this, I'm, I'm not going to go into 9-11, but I'm just going to pick out one thing, just to show you, a, a, for anyone new to this, uh, how this works. Just one aspect, and my goodness, I cooked for 9-11 for hours. A tissue, a tissue, it all falls down. This is Building 7, also known as the Solomon Brothers Building. 47 floors, and this fell not being hit by anything, and it fell in the, in the afternoon, in the late afternoon on 9-11, and it was said that it fell because fire uh, destabilized it and it fell as a result of that. Well, that's the official story, but there's another story I'll come to. Now, this lady is a BBC reporter, and the picture you see is her in a live interview with a uh, newsreader in London, in which she's saying on 9-11 that the... Building 7 building has just collapsed, right? And as she's saying it's collapsed, it's still freaking standing behind her, right? Now, what people say is, Yo, you're saying the BBC's on in the conspiracy then. Well, or the inner core, yes. Most of it, no. They just don't know their ass from their freaking elbow. I've been there. Now, what was this all about? What was this all about? When they're unfolding a scam, a manufactured terrorist event, what's running side by side is the propaganda going out in sequence with it. What they did was put the a fact that that had fallen out about half an hour or more before it actually did. They got out of frickin' sequence. And so it was reported before it happened. Look at this, a controlled demolition. This is Building 7, look at it. Falling in on itself. Absolute classic. Um, and if we look at this one, just watch these uh, red dots here when it changes, those positions. Look, there's the freaking things going off and bringing it down. It's classic controlled demolition, which they said it was, like the towers, it was brought down by natural, if you like, things that uh, destabilized it. Um, now, as I said, the official story is building Selvin fell. Uh, because it fell, because it was destabilized. But this guy, Lyre Silverstein, some people call him Larry, but I like to keep to the truth. Lyre Silverstein, he was one of the co-leaseholders of the World Trade Center, and he bought the lease just weeks before 9-11, and when he bought it, massively upped the insurance in the event of a terrorist attack. Now, this is what he said in an interview, which you can see on the internet, about the collapse of Building 7. I remember getting a call from the fire department commander telling me that they were not sure they were going to be able to contain the fire. And I said, you know, we've had such a terrible loss of life. Maybe the smartest thing is to pull it. And they made that decision to pull and we watched the building collapse. Right, just a few little problems with that, Mr. Liar Silverstein. A, fire departments do not pull buildings. B, putting the, the explosives in the right place to put, let it fall in on itself in a controlled explosion takes weeks, sometimes months, to put in there. Not a few minutes, you freaking liar. You know what happened. Now, Liar Silverstein used to have breakfast every single morning, official, officially accepted, in a restaurant at the top of one of the Twin Towers. I think it's called the Top of the World Restaurant or something. Now, can you just think what day he might have missed? <laughs> eh? Because, he said, his wife had got him a dermatology appointment. And he said it saved his life. No, what saved your freaking life, darling, is you knew what was coming and you didn't give a shit. That's what saved your freaking life. And what's that? No empathy, no remorse. Archontic personality. Attar, Muslim fanatic, according to his American girlfriend, widely quoted, he um, loved pork chops, used cocaine very liberally, and was anything but a Muslim fanatic. And this is Aaron Russell, award-winning film producer. Uh, and be before he died, 
he started speaking out about the conspiracy and what he knew about it. And he told a story of meeting Nick Rockefeller, Rockefellers, Rothschilds, they're all involved in this, um, and how Nick Rockefeller tried to uh, get him into, the, into the, the circle, recruit him. And he said this when he met Nick Rockefeller, this was about a year, around a year uh, before 9-11. He said that Nick Rockefeller told him there would be an event that would lead to the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq to take over the oil fields and establish a base in the Middle East. Rousseau would see uh, soldiers looking in caves in Afghanistan and Pakistan for Osama bin Laden. There would be an endless war on terror where there's no real enemy. The whole thing would be a giant hoax. The people have to be ruled, he said, and the population reduced by at least half. Plans for uh, mass microchipping of the serfs he also talked about. That's the truth, and of course, at 9-11, they put a, a memorial, classic frickin' Saturn, a memorial to the victims. And then there's another version of this, uh, which I call no problem reaction solution, where you don't need a problem that's real, you need a perception of a problem that you can use in, as an excuse to offer the solutions, um, and they are climate change uh, caused by human activity, global warming, they are weapons of mass destruction in Iraq and all that stuff. All the time we are getting no problem reaction solutions as well. And the, the, the antidote to this problem reaction solution, create the problem, get the reaction, offer the solutions, the problems you've created, is who benefits? Who benefits from me accepting the official version of this? And invariably, who will benefit is anyone that wants to take on this uh, a conspiracy, this uh, agenda, which I'm going to describe in some detail as we go along here. Alongside problem, reaction, solution, there's what I call the totalitarian tiptoe, where you go to your long focus goal, but you go in steps so you don't alert too many people of the direction you're going until you're there and it's a done deal and then it doesn't really matter. Um, this is a classic totalitarian tiptoe where we went from a free trade area to a centralized, fascist, communist, bureaucratic dictatorship, which we have now. And it was the, what we have now was planned from the start. But if they'd have said that at the start, people would have been outraged. So they've done it in steps, calculated. This is Jean Monnet, a founding father of the EU, they call him, and a Rothschild frontman. In a letter to a friend, uh, what, uh, the day after I was born, in 1952, Europe's nations should be guided towards the superstate without their people understanding what is happening. This can be accomplished by successive steps, each disguised as having an economic purpose, but which will eventually and irreversibly lead to federation. It's been a stitch up from the start, and everything else is a smokescreen. So we went from the USSR, oh, USSR, fear, fear, to the U EU SSSR. And the only difference is, really, that they've got a uh, European Parliament that gives it the, the, the coating of democracy when it's got no power at all, and the rest of it is bureaucratic dictatorship. And another totalitarian tiptoe has been the constant expansion of centralization of power around the world to the point where long ago it was given a name, globalization. And the idea is to create interdependence between all nations so you have a loss of independence um, of running your own affairs because you are constantly uh, in hoc or, or looking to other people to do things that you can't do for yourselves. That's the idea, interdependency. And this is the, the structure that they want. And the whole thing is about centralizing power. The more you centralize power, clearly the fewer people have control over more and more people. You centralize more, even fewer people have control over even more people. And what happens is the more you centralize power, the more you power you have centrally to uh, centralize even quicker. And so centralization uh, of power goes faster and faster and faster because of that sequence. They want a world government that would dictate to every country. In fact, they want the end of countries. They want a world central bank that would dictate all global finance. They want a world single currency that would be purely electronic, no cash, um, for which there are massive implications for freedom. If you go into a shop now and you, you ask for um, something and you say, I'll pay with a credit card, electronic money, and they say, no, sorry, won't accept your card, you can still pay cash. When there's no cash, what that decides dictates if you can buy and what you buy and all the rest of it. Um, they, they want a world army to impose the will of the world government, and that is NATO. Way back in the 1990s, I was saying, watch for NATO. <laughs>
as the, as the man said, as the man said, I've, I've been to the top of the mountain and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. I'll freaking get there with you. I'll get there freaking with you. I'm not going until this change, this transformation is over. I've invested too much of my life in this. But if you talk about destruction, don't you know you can count me out? We don't have to fight. Critical thinking is not the manifestation of red mist. We need to stay calm. We need to stay in the heart. You don't fight for peace. You peace for peace. All the reasons I've talked about. I'm no longer accepting things that I cannot change. It's time to change things that I cannot accept and not accept anything less. Be a loose cog in the machine and the machine will cease to function. Stop cooperating if no one, uh, no one rules, if no one obeys. That's the point. And there's billions of us being oppressed by a few. If we stop uh, cooperating with our own oppression, the game is over. Unthinking respect for authority is the greatest enemy of truth. Look at it. What if these these sheep, these goats, whatever they are, refused to cooperate with these two. What would these two do? They would know what to do. It's all over. And uh, this is a great quote from Gandhi. Don't cooperate with evil, he said. You assist an evil system most effectively by obeying its orders and decrees. An evil system never deserves such allegiance. Allegiance uh, to that means uh, partaking of this evil. A good person will resist an evil system with his or her own soul. We need to stop cooperating with our own enslavement together, and it will be over. It's our cooperation with our own enslavement that makes it possible. What happens if they stop complying, Mom? We're fucked! <laughs> If they didn't comply, they're fucked. Stop complying, start defying. There will be no change. There is no change through the political system. We're not going to change anything through the political system because its very structure is there to stop anything changing. We have to change it by not cooperating with the system. Nothing strengthens authority so much as silence. Freedom or tyranny, that's the choice. Blue pill, red pill. And it is a choice, that's the wonder. We are in a situation where we are still in control of our destiny by the choices we make. But we need to make them together and work together. Mind prison or free thought, choice. Matrix has us or matrix doesn't have us, choice. Awaken from the program. Open your mind to consciousness. Open your mind to all possibility. Open your heart to infinite forever. That, again, is the revolution. And this conspiracy and this fake matrix will not survive that revolution of perception, that revolution of energy, that revolution of frequency, that revolution of human society. Beyond the bounds of time and space, open your heart, open your heart, make that the point that we interact with reality. Open your heart to beyond time and space so intuitively we get the inspiration, the insight, the knowing that is there to be tapped beyond time and space. Not ahead of our time, beyond time. It's all there just waiting to be tapped into. Saying, come to me, come to me, come to me. People say, when's the cavalry coming? If the cavalry came, it would not be the cavalry because it would be in our frequency and thus in our perceptions. Thus, we have to open our heart to the cavalry and the cavalry is us. It's not some guy in a spaceship. It is the greater self that we've become disconnected from. Rise of the truth vibrations. This vibrational information change. The heart tunes us into them. The heart starts the revolution, the adventure out of the program into true self. And we start to dance to a different drum. What a great line that is. Those who danced were thought to be quite insane by those who could not hear the music. More and more are starting to hear the music. Awaken, awaken, awaken. We now have a, a period of...
vibrational expansion coming up. If we can open our hearts and just tune with it and go with it. Lose yourself, girl, as my mate used to say in the 60s. Go for it, girl. Open your heart and just see where it takes, where the vibration takes, out of mind, out of program, into heart. Just flowing with the energy, the information, the awareness that this space is now pulsating with after the day that we've had. So let's dance to a different drum. Go for it. A violin by the very people they think they're opposing. Top US military uh, official admits our uh, Arab allies are funding ISIS. What happened to those allies? They became part of the terror coalition against ISIS. You couldn't make it up. Kerry meets the Saudis. I just wanted to discuss how we stop the terrorists we're both arming. <laughs> 2011, Kerry, Assad is a very generous man. When it suits him, Assad is evil, I condemn him. And this is, this is how it works, it's very simple. We arm people when it suits us, uh, our agenda. We kill people when it suits our agenda. We say this when it suits our agenda. We say the opposite when it suits our agenda. That's the common theme. So he didn't get his Syrian war unfortunately for him, because people sussed it was a scam, but they're in Syria now because they've scammed the uh, ISIS story, and that's what it's all about. And um, here is the real reason they're in Syria, to remove him and get around the uh, resistance from the people. It's the totalitarian tiptoe, and here we go. No new war, they said, we've got a new war. We won't bomb in Syria, they're bombing in Syria. This is not about Assad, let's have a no-fly zone to stop people who haven't got planes. It's about Assad who has got planes. No boots on the ground, they'll have boots on the ground. We're only keeping the peace, World War III. That's the progression they want. And they want to pull Russia and China into it. It's all part of that um, Albert Pike scenario. So they're now demonizing Russia. If you look at my books from way back, it was talking about you watch them start to demonize Russia, which is what they're doing now as part of this. And they, they, they blame them on bringing that plane down. Hasn't that gone quiet since radar revealed that it was being escorted by two Ukrainian jets at the time it went down? And if anyone thinks that that's uh, you know, amazing, well, footage of Ukrainian helicopters firing on its own checkpoint raises questions. <laughs> They're bombing their own people and then blaming on Russian separatists. This is how the game works. And that is their um, focus. That's what they want to take over. Then we have Ebola. It just happens to be in two freaking countries where there are US bio-warfare laboratories. Have you got enough room in America? And the uh, Centers for Disease Control in America have a patent on the human Ebola virus. There you go, Sierra Leone closes down US bioweapons lab. I bet they did, pretty bloody sharpish. Another foreign news outlet links US biowarfare labs to Ebola outbreak. What a coincidence. ISIS, we must intervene in the Middle East. Ebola, we must intervene in Africa. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. And then you've got the public health emergency declared in Connecticut over Ebola, civil rights suspended indefinitely and all that shit that they can use. And this is what fear does to people. This is a passenger at Washington airport waiting to get on a plane. This is how the perception deception works. Fear, make them fear and they'll give you their power. Our complete state. If you look at this um, structure, that is designed to keep this status quo in place. So what we're seeing is more and more vicious, psychopathic police states around the world, in Britain and in America. They have a kill list in America. He can kill anyone he likes if it's on the kill list. He doesn't have to go through any judicial oversight. He can take anyone off the streets he likes and not have to take them through due process. So and so it goes on. There's almost a law against everything now because they want to tie us into a web like a spider ties a fly with regulations and laws. Uh, we've got this outbreak of luminous jackets 
They're breeding, I'm sure they are, in the night. They're all over the place, these things. They're like roundabouts in Milton Keynes. They're breeding. And you've got a certain type of mentality in the uh, administration of all this. I am a Dalek, rules must be obeyed, exterminate, exterminate, inability. You know, they've got little, little cracks in their head where the bloody computer chip goes in. What are you? I'm a government administrator. I thought you were. There you go. I bet they have no idea what prats they look. But what this, is, what this is about is the way the police are turning from the police as we knew them systematically because of Agenda 21 and what I'm talking about into the military. More and more vicious. Go into YouTube and put in police violence. You'll be there for bloody months. And what they've been systematically doing, I've been saying this for years, is recruiting people overwhelmingly on the basis of personality type, not ability to do the job. That's why the good cops and the good coppers are disappearing and these psychopaths are coming in more and more to replace them. Psychopaths who do this. Psychopaths who do this and face no consequences. Taser tots, Indiana police taser a 10-year-old boy at daycare center. It's madness. Here's a new weapon they're introducing that can blind people for up to 15 bloody minutes. Here's a totalitarian tiptoe there. Tasers for the few, tasers for the many, tasers for all. Guns for specialist officers, first guns on routine patrol. They're having a trial of guns on routine patrol and then guns for all. That's the totalitarian tiptoe of that one. And this is America now and these are police. They have a, a, um, a system um, in America now called 1033, the 1033 system, in which um, police forces can get uh, so-called uh, surplus military technology and weaponry from the military, the US military, and use it to police the local communities. It's unbelievable. But it's not really, because this is the transformation to the police state to impose Agenda 21. Why does a Florida County Police Department need eight 18 million Apache Italic helicopters? Answer, Agenda 21. This is what it's moving towards. School cops across uh, Texas receiving surplus military gear. School cops. You're he we're here to protect your freedom. No, you're here to take it away because you are the real domestic terrorists. That's the truth. <laughs> An extremist, a label used to discredit and marginalize anyone whose opinion is a threat to the state because they figured out how corrupt it is while sustaining a constant sense of fear or alarm in the minds of the public. An extremist, someone who's susja. That's what it is. And you can expose war crimes and you go to prison with the key thrown away. You can commit war crimes and you get a Nobel Peace Prize. And this is what the police and law enforcement need to understand. They are part of the 99.9% .9 and their children and their grandchildren have to live in the world that they are helping to impose on others. And think about this, police officers of this country. This is what's designed to happen. Private security firms are designed to take all of your bloody jobs and take over the policing of the people via corporations. Uh, let's go this way. Oh, there you go. A time to choose. Morality, doing what is right regardless of what you are told. Obedience, doing what you are told regardless of what is right. Which way we go there decides on the world we're going to live in. Every great atrocity is the result of people following orders. It's time for the police to realize that they're designed to live in this world as well. This world of constant surveillance for their families and their children where they, they, they've got drones now that can, they, that can take down your login codes and your bloody mobile phone. It's madness. Um, you've got these bloody surveillance, bloody insects flying around now. It's madness. These people are mad. And Bill Gates, for it is he, five billion plan. Let's put a camera in every classroom. Bill Gates spends 1.1 million fitting students with their mood bracelets to see if their teachers are boring. 
God, it's going on. Schools installing facial recognition systems to identify troublemakers. Get them ready for it. Bill passes allowing police to shut off all cell phones remotely. It, all internet activity now monitored by pre-crime uh, algorithms. This is uh, UPS. Every time he moves his ass in that seat, someone back at headquarters knows he's done it. And I'm not kidding. If he backs it up, they know he's backed up. If he walks out, he knows he's not sitting there. This is what's planned with these um, uh, black boxes they're putting in cars increasingly. So everywhere we go is tracked. EU to bug every car in the UK with tracker chips, which they can't stop this big brother technology. They've got cameras to go into cars that are constantly monitoring your mood so you don't get caught in road rage. Advert that was actually emphasizing this, these two very different functions of different sides of the brain. And what the system does, because it knows that this is where creativity is, this is what connects the dots. Because this sees the tapestry, this sees the strands. If they keep you in the left brain, it's all dots. You get in the right brain, the dots are a picture. That's why they don't want us to connect the dots. That's why they don't want us in the right side of the brain. And so they put the soldiers on the gate of the left side of the brain to stop the right side getting in and having an influence. And what is that? It's doctors, it's journalists. And I'm not saying they know what they're, do they're doing this. They don't, they've gone through the system as well. It's scientists academics in all their forms and uh, all the rest of it and if you look at exams in education what we call education it's all all left side of the brain information and uh, all the time cutbacks in the arts and things that would open the right side of the brain I've never made one of my discoveries said Einstein through the process of rational thinking no through going to another level of awareness beyond the village idiot of rational thinking as we perceive it. Cosmic communication. This is the uh, wireless internet on an electrical level. Um, there's a whole area of science now uh, called the electric universe. Two of the great pioneers and founders are Wallace Thornhill and uh, David Talbot. This is a brilliant book, it's very difficult to get hold of, explaining how the um, the universe has an uh, electrical level, electrical, electromagnetic level. It explains so much. We all realize that there's electricity in the atmosphere because we see lightning. What we don't realize is when something's lightning in the lower atmosphere, there's other um, electrical things going on right out into the cosmos because it's an electrical system. Uh, this is a new story. High-speed solar winds increase lightning strikes on Earth. Scientists have discovered new evidence to suggest that lightning on Earth is triggered not only by cosmic rays from space, but also by energetic particles from the sun. There is an electrical, electromagnetic field which connects everything. Electrical tornadoes, they are fast-rotating electro, electrical, electromagnetic fields. The um, northern lights, the aura uh, borealis, electrical light show, Electrical comets as they interact with the electrical level of the universe. Electrical galaxy, the spinning of the galaxy. And uh, Nikola Tesla said this, all peoples everywhere should have free energy sources. Electric power is everywhere present in unlimited quantities and can drive the world's machinery without the need for coal, oil and gas. And he knew that. He knew that, and he died penniless in a hotel room in New York in 1943. And who are the forces that are suppressing this knowledge? The very sources that are telling you we must deindustrialize because of global bloody warming. That's a load of bollocks anyway. <laughs> Scam. Gravity is powerful, okay, the electrical force is about a thousand trillion, trillion times more powerful than gravity. This is what the magnetic force is capable of. And as the electrical universe um, postulates, the force that hold the planets in their places and their stability are not gravitational forces, they are electromagnetic forces, which brings about a very simple thing. If you can, or something 
destabilizes those electromagnetic forces, then the planets go walkabout. And I'll get to this in part two, but they went walkabout in geological terms very bloody recently. 99.99% um, .99 of the universe's or our reality is plasma. And plasma just happens to be an almost perfect medium for electrical forces. They say uh, in the laboratory, plasma exhibits a lifelike ability to self-organize and cope with the stresses of its electrical environment. Why? Because it's conscious. Everything is conscious. And in the electrical universe arena, they can recapture happenings in the heavens in the laboratory using things like plasma focus devices. Try getting mainstream to replicate what they say happens in the universe and how. Electrical sun, plasma sun, almost entirely plasma, they say. Why? Because it is a uh, processor of electrical power, information. Electric sun, I mean, it's not bloody obvious, is it? Um, and they say that what the sun is, is like a nuclear reactor that starts in the middle and convex out. Well, they say there's a radiative zone. Well, apparently there's very little evidence, if any, for that. And the convective zone they've found is about 1% of it needs, that it needs to be to, to do what they say it does. What the electrical universe uh, position says, with tremendous evidence, is that actually it's coming the other way. It's not coming out from the sun, it's coming into the sun, being processed, and then going out from the sun in another um, form. In ultraviolet light, um, you have um, a, what they call a torus or a, like a donut around the sun, well out, and it is a collector of electrical power. And what happens is, as that electrical power builds up and builds up, just like lightning is a release of too much electricity in the atmosphere, so um, there are massive releases of electrical power from this torus, and they head for the sun, and they bang into the sun, create massive holes that we call sunspots. According to the electric universe, sunspots are not going that way and banging outwards, they're coming this way and banging outwards. And here's another kind of thing that supports where the power is really coming from. On the surface of the sun, it's about 5,000 degrees Kelvin, that, that, uh, that heat uh, measurement called Kelvin. And in the upper levels of the sun, way out from the surface, it's 200 million degrees. Uh, that's the sunspots. And so you have cycles when this electrical power is very, very powerful and when it's less powerful. And that is what creates the sun cycle. When there's more power coming from the sun and then there's less power. Another great thing that explains uh, Another thing is when plasma has a electrical force or electrical state of a certain kind and it meets plasma with an electrical state of another kind, the plasma automatically creates a barrier between the two. They're called Langmuir sheaths after Irvin Langmuir who discovered them. And that's why we have these energy fields around planets and we in our electrical, electromagnetic level, and the planets are interacting with this electrical force which is delivering, again, information within the cosmic internet. Um, and again, you've got the brain cell and the, um, the universe. So this starts to explain this. Astrology. What we call planets and stars are in their base form, waveform information fields. And as they move through the greater cosmic internet, they are impacting upon it in terms of changed information. They're changing its nature. And when these um, planets mo uh, move into certain situations in relation to each other, the impact becomes even greater. And so where the planets are, dictates the nature of the energy field. And when we come into this reality, we pick up the energy field at that point in the cycle. And so we pick up a different energy field to someone else. And we interact with the energy field as we go through our life, therefore, in a different way compared with someone else who comes into the cycle at a different point. And that's 
what we call astrology. And at, it, at its deep scientific level, it is a science. Not in the, you know, local newspaper with a little one paragraph, but at its deep level, it is a science. In the right hands. Everything in the right hands. And because we live in a hologram, this is a smaller version of the universe, a smaller version of everything we perceive to be above it. Now, time and space are great creators of illusion, and that's what they are, illusions. Far away, we see stars, we say they're billions of light years away. Hold on. In that form, they exist when we decode them here. They're centimeters away, in effect. And it's just, again, waveform into hologram. Space. When you think this world is, 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 quote, real and solid and has a time, if you take this to be the human world and this to be the line of history, um, we have a version of time which is just manufactured, which appears to give a sequence of events and all the rest of it. Within the interspace plane, they have movable time. They can move up and down this timeline. So they can come in here and they can uh, control someone from the 16th century or the 15th century. They come in here, they're controlling people from the, what we call the 20th century because the time is an illusion. So it's been the same entities that have been moving through what we perceive as time all the way through history. And of course, in, when you get across here, there's no time. And that's why that near-death experiencer said there is no time, there is no sequence of events, no such thing as limitation of distance, of period, of time, of place. I could be anywhere I wanted to be simultaneously. So can these to a, a large extent, and therefore they're moving in and out of this timeline. To, to, to achieve this, they want puppet people. And to do that, they have to control the coordinates that people have in terms of their perception of reality. And uh, that's what they've done. And they've confused people into being confused, which is the state they want them to be in. And we look at the world and we think it's so complicated and complex and all the rest of it, but there is a very simple structure behind it. Because of what's been going on with the research into this conspiracy, and indeed at our own bloody eyes now when we look on the news and we see the world the way it is with the centralization of power, it's very difficult now to deny that a few people control the many. Um, it was possible for a while maybe, but not anymore. So what they've done through this book by a guy called David Rothkoff, who worked for the infamous Kissinger Associates and was in the Clinton administration and stuff, he's wrote this, written this book called Superclass, The Global Power Elite and the World They Are Making. And what it is, in effect, is an admission that yes, there is a super elite and it does control events, but it's not coordinated and it's not controlled. It's like a fallback position. All right, we can't deny if you control the world now, so we'll have a fallback position. Yeah, they do, but they're not coordinated. It's just a loose connection of interests. You know, bullshit. In fact, it's coldly calculated and it's very, very simply constructed. And I want to go through a few coordinates now of how this um, group, this, high, this hybrid bloodline, with the goals that I've described, how it's structured society to bring about its ends. First of all, how can a few control the world? Or well, pyramid power, in, in more ways than one. But this sort of pyramid I'm talking about now. Um, most organizations today, in fact, nearly virtually all of them, are structured as pyramids. You've got the few at the top, they're the people that know the real game, what the organization's there for, its real agenda, what it's really trying to achieve. As you come down through the organization, you're meeting more and more and more people in the organization, but every time you drop a step, they know less and less and less about what the organization's really about. They only know their contribution. And the idea through history has been to structure society like this to keep the people in general in ignorance of what they know. That's why this advanced knowledge has been passed over through the highest levels of the secret society network and been sucked out of the general population through inquisitions and ridicule and condemnation and all the rest of it. Um, 
but every organization structured like that. So the vast majority of people who are daily making a contribution to creating this Orwellian state have no idea they're doing so, or at least no idea what the end goal is and who's really behind it. This is um, Albert Pike, a, a Freemasonic god in America, um, and from the last century, or the 1800s actually, um, we're 21st century now, aren't we? What day is it? What planet am I on? And he wrote this, fictions are necessary to the people and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. In fact, what can there be in common between the vile multitude, that's us, and sublime wisdom? The truth must be kept secret and the masses need a teaching proportioned to their imperfect reason. So, what they're doing is that ancient knowledge, that ancient advanced knowledge I talked about, they have sucked it out as much as they can out of circulation through inquisitions and all the stuff, but they've passed it on and more across the secret society network. So at that level, not Joe Bloggs, the Freemason, goes down the lodge, they do a nice dinner, not that, right up the top. They're working on a knowledge of reality that I talked about earlier, and they're using it to manipulate the masses who they keep from that knowledge. And uh, pyramid power works like this too. We think presidents and prime ministers and stuff are at the top of the decision-making process. Uh, they're not. They are positioned lower in the pyramid and they are just vehicles for the shadow people to introduce changes in society through them. So you have an idiot like Bush and he turns um, this stuff through legislation into law just by signing his soddy name when he can remember it on the bottom of a piece of paper. That's what they're there for. They are vehicles. They're not the source of the power. People say to me, so you say George Bush orchestrated 9-11. Can't tie his shoelaces, mate. No, I'm not saying that. No. <laughs> Ridiculous. You're a journalist, aren't you? Yes, I thought you were. <laughs> you thought that elephant was a duck, right? Yeah, I got you. I remember you now. And these pyramids are like Russian dolls. One doll inside a bigger doll inside a bigger doll um, to create this global structure. So all these pyramids of, of the banking system, um, the transnational corporations, they're pyramids in themselves like banks. And they go into bigger pyramids and bigger pyramids until there's one that encompasses the whole of the banking system, one that controls all the transnational corporations, the political parties, the major parties at least that have any chance of forming a government, the, the media at ownership level, the religions, bloody come to that soon. The intelligence agencies at that level are the same agency. Mossad is the CIA, is British intelligence if you go up to these levels. Same with the, the uh, drug cartel, etc. And so up here, you have these bloodline families who are sending down these pyramids, all roads lead to them, the same agenda. And the basis of it is the constant centralization of power and imposition of will of the, of the, of the authorities on the people. And that's why it's happening across all these apparently unconnected areas of society, because they're not unconnected. What you have is one force operating through different sides in the movie. And while we think there are different sides as we experience the movie in visible light reality, we get confused. I mean, what, he's, he's on that side, he's on that side, and he's fighting him, and he's against him, and he's against her. But in fact, they're controlled by the same people. And, and you know, if you uh, go into a football match, and you control not one side to influence the football match, you control both sides, you know what the score's going to be before the teams go on the field. And this is why uh, they operate like this. They operate um, by uh, controlling uh, what appear to be sides and antagonists in the um, five sense uh, reality, but in fact, it's just a movie. It's part of a game pushing the agenda for Orwellian control. This is what I'm talking about with that uh, image earlier. These people, they might appear to fight in the movie, but actually, they're controlled ultimately by the same force to the same end. 
And some of these will be the reptilian bloodline, some of them might not be. I think most of these probably are. But the, the, these are just puppets, even they might be powerful puppets against, uh, over people below them in the structure, but they're still puppets of the shadow people who are really calling the shots and deciding what goes on and what doesn't. And because of this genetic um, situation in the hybrid bloodlines of empathy, lack of empathy, because of the predominance compared with the general population of the reptilian brain genetics, um, they can do horrendous things that we couldn't even contemplate because we have empathy with the victims of our actions. They do not. Without that emotional consequence, there are no limits, and we see that on the news every day. Another coordinate, the way that we are manipulated through what are mind and emotional manipulation techniques, Problem, reaction, solution. It was a term I came up with years ago to describe something that is known as the Hegelian dialectic among people with, um, uh, who like long syllables. And, uh, and uh, mix your sound. No wonder people are turning to alternative news outlets. Okay, let's go. And to be fair to the person involved who's just doing her job, what chance has she got, even if she wanted to, of putting this event in context, having missed the first three and a half hours and missing probably most of what's to come after this section? Anyway, let's have a recap. This is, uh, this is who we are. We are infinite awareness, having an experience. Uh, the idea of the conspiracy is to make us identify with the experience. Boom! Little me, I have no power. I am all limited. I am uh, just someone who has to follow others. And to manipulate the way we decode reality to fit the ability of the few to control the many by keeping the many in a fraction of who they really are by identifying with name, with job, with family and income bracket instead of the true nature of infinite self. And to hijack the way we decode reality through the five senses to impose a very different one. To give us the idea that we must follow, we have no power. Someone else must tell us what to think, what to do. And it's control of perception. Like I said earlier, if you control someone's perception, you control their actions, which come from perceptions. And uh, that's the idea. And all these things, uh, interestingly, all those news organizations, what are they doing? They're telling people what to think. Um, and the other thing is that when you, as, especially as we go through the section after this one, all the different expressions of this conspiracy, uh, everything from banking scams to uh, vaccines to uh, fake human caused global warming, uh, stuff in uh, additives in food, fake uh, terrorist attacks so that you can change society by justifying change. The idea that all this is being orchestrated by men and women in dark suits or whatever, sitting around a table, it takes on the bounds of ludicrousness. Do these exist? Of course they do. But they are the outer, outer rim of the rabbit hole. And when you go beyond them, deeper into uh, the uh, manipulation, you go through them into the advisors. The people that we think are in power, that's only for public consumption. They're here today, gone tomorrow people, in all the areas of institutions and politics, and another bunch will come along tomorrow, but the same force will be controlling them as well. That's the common theme, that's the cement. And you hit the advisors one step back. You go deeper in the rabbit hole, and you go into these really exclusive secret societies, which are way uh, uh, back out of the public domain, and yet they are fundamentally influencing and impacting on what happens in the public domain. So when you've got someone like Obama, um, he is announcing legislation, he's signing executive orders and death lists for bloody drone missiles in uh, Pakistan, etc. But he ain't the one who's deciding all this. He's the one that's the point that brings it into reality through legislative change. Um, and so behind all these apparently unconnected areas like uh, banks and biotech uh, cartels and uh, 
NATO and the World Health Organization, World Trade Organization, uh, the media and all this stuff at ownership level is this same force in the background. Um, and indeed, you know, to a certain extent, this was acknowledged by the uh, Swiss Institute of Technology in Zurich um, when they did this study on the connections between transnational corporations. And they found that these ones that are really red, these very, very few, have so many connections to the others that in effect that's one unit, which is what I've been saying for bloody years, that behind the apparent uh, independence of these corporations, they're actually controlled and connected into the same uh, group. And, you know, you've got these green lines connecting these transnational corporations, but around this group, there's so many connections, it's just one blob of green. Um, and when you take the uh, next step and you realize that the same network of families are actually controlling all these apparently unconnected transnational corporations, suddenly you can see that it's possible to push the world through all these different aspects of society in a uh, common direction. So we have this thing, you call it globalization. What is globalization? It is the centralization of power in every area of our lives. When there's a few and you want to control the many, you have to centralize decision making. The more diversity of decision making there is, the more uh, power uh, uh, obviously is diverted away from the center. The more you centralize, the fewer have control of, of more and more and more. So this is why we've seen this process of so-called globalization, which is what? It is centralizing power into fewer and fewer hands, so fewer and fewer people are having a bigger, bigger say and impact on more and more people. This is the idea. It's the only way you can do it. And like I think I said earlier, the more you centralize power, the more power you have at the center to centralize even quicker. That's why this process of centralization has got faster and faster. And as you can see, as we saw in the Olympics, the power of the corporations, the British public put in like nine billion into the Olympics, and uh, the corporations together put in about a billion, and yet they got everything. So much so that little people in their, in their businesses or homes were being threatened with bloody uh, with the law if they just put some of the major symbols of the Olympics or words, you know, in a display. I was on the Isle of Wight. I just went out of interest, took a few pictures when the flame came through. I want to see what happened. This little town on the Isle of Wight, East Cows, that you would never know the Olympic flame was coming through. There was nothing. Why? Because they were all terrified of being uh, sued by uh, the corporations and those uh, in government representing the corporations that had hijacked the Olympics. Uh, so it doesn't matter who is the president or prime minister, because the same force is in control. What force is that? And if you look at these underground bases, they call them DUMS, deep underground military bases, they're all over the world. The, the level of uh, security clearance to uh, go deep into these bases and know what's going on is way above anybody political leader. They haven't got a clue what's going on in here. So they get elected and they have a, oh, he's a prime minister, he's got power, oh, someone else has come in. And while all that's going on, someone's running these bloody things without the people in political power, apparent power, having a clue about it. If we find who, who is running these things, then we're getting very close to who's actually running the direction of human society. So behind it all is a force. The question is, what is it? So this is where we enter the, the twilight zone. But it's a twilight zone. Again, everything is a point of observation. A twilight zone to a mainstream journalist will be perfectly pretty logical to someone who's done 50 uh, 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 years or so, or 25 years, or how many years it is of research into something. Um, and uh, this is an important point about perception. One of the greatest ways that humanity is controlled is by the suppression of the sense of the possible. Once you put a wall on the sense of the possible, gotcha! Because anything that comes in, say the lie, if the uh, sense of the possible is not fluid but rigid, it will have no alternative to the lie. I'll give you an example. If the mind is so rigid about possibility that it cannot perceive the fact 
that you can mind manipulate someone to either go shooting people uh, uh, in, a, in a crazed shooting or be in the wrong place at the wrong time to be blamed for it when someone else has actually done it, then when the government comes out, whatever it is, and gives you the version of, of uh, done blame or gives you a version of uh, uh, the Colorado shooting in the theater and the, the shooting in the, uh, the uh, Sikh temple in Wisconsin, then you have no alternative to the lie because you can't perceive the possibility of anything else. But if you've got an open mind and an inquiring mind and a much wider sense of the possible, then you can look at the lie from another perspective and say, well, maybe this is what happened. So controlling the sense of the possible, because if you're doing things out here and you've got the sense of the possible here, then when people like me say, this is what's going on, that goes, you're bloody mad, that's not possible, that can't be going on. Um, and, and the biggest problem is that, and it's not every one of them, by the way, I was talking to one the other day who was uh, very kind of intelligent involved, involved, in, uh, involved in all this, but this in general is my experience after a, a 25 years of the uh, perception of the possible of a mainstream bloody journalist. And that's why, now, awaken, awaken, awaken. Well, we're going into some challenging information here and in the next section, so let me focus again. Um, the idea that this, uh, this is a lost cause that we're involved in here is no way it's a lost cause. We take our power back, game over. So we can paint another picture. Please hold that thought because it's, um, it's very, very important we don't get pulled into fear by seeing what we're involved with. Now, Gino Cristomurdi said something very, very true when he said, if we can really understand the problem, the answer will come out of it, because the answer is not separate from the problem. They're indivisible. And you know, what I find in like some what they call new age areas and stuff like that is, you mustn't talk about anything negative. Oh no. Well, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I've never come across any knowledge that was negative. I've come across knowledge I'd rather not uh, be true, but I've never come across knowledge that's actually negative. Ignorance is freaking negative, not knowledge, because you can do something with knowledge. And so the idea that you know, we should be frightened of, 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 of looking at things as they really are, I mean, it's just another version of looking the other way and hoping it will go away. It won't. So when people say, well, What's the solutions? Well, fundamental to any solution is to understand the nature of what we're dealing with. Because then we've got a much better chance of dealing with it. We know what we, we've got to deal with. And, you know, a lot in the conspiracy research arena, like I said earlier, brilliant. There's so many people involved in this now. But the vast majority of them will not go even close to where we're going to go in the next two hours or so because of religious belief systems or because, well, even if it's true and I say it, I'm going to lose my credibility. I think you lose your credibility if you don't go with what you, be, you believe to be true and you edit that on the basis of what will people think of me if I say it. That's how we got into this freaking mess. And unless we understand how deep the rabbit hole goes and what we're dealing with, we're never going to find an answer to it. And just stockpiling weapons and, and fighting the system is just playing into the system's hands for reasons that will become clear, indeed, uh, possibly already have. So we are infinite awareness, uh, capable of multiple realities and perceiving multiple realities. We've been caught in the bamboozle, which has led to this and this through the uh, control of perception. So who or what is ultimately behind this? Uh, or at least uh, the depth of the rabbit hole we've got so far. Well, they ain't for a start, because they're just here today, gone tomorrow, people who are just puppets of a system that's here yesterday, today, tomorrow, and the next day. Um, it's not him. I don't care if he's supposed to be the most powerful man in the world. He ain't. He's another bloody glove puppet. And anyone in that job, the same applies to. It's not him either. Here today, gone tomorrow, uh, presidents and leaders who are replaced by other leaders. But the thing, the system, the direction goes on because there's something behind that that's pushing that direction on. And nor even is it the corporations. 
they're still at the level of playing out the control. It's not actually at the point of creating it. It's not the origin. It's not people sitting around tables. They're still at the point of playing it out. You can go into the shadows and you can get closer to where it's coming from, but you're still at the play out level. You go even deeper into the rabbit hole, really deep into the web. And that's where you find people like the Rothschilds and such like. You don't see us, but we control your life. But there's levels beyond that where it's coming from. But where is it? Okay, well, I'm going to cut to the freaking chase, really. The truth doesn't change because you don't want to hear it. Now, obviously, I can't go into great detail with this. I mean, the, the perception deception is that bloody big. This the whole day is about connecting dots to show the picture. And all I can say is for 25 years, I've been full time on this, and the, the evidence has brought me to this uh, conclusion. Um, there's no one out there. See, all that is there's no one out there. And when you think that what we're seeing is only what is uh, within a narrow band of visible light, and then you think what possibilities lie beyond that in the great infinite forever, the idea that we are alone is absolutely beyond ludicrous and the fact that you can be seen as crazy for believing that shows how inverted the system is. This w reality, this infinity, is teeming with different expressions of life. And some of it's interacting with us. This is um, Professor of Mathematics and Astronomy at Queen's Mary University, London, Bernard Carr. He said, our consciousness interacts with another dimension, actually many other dimensions. Our physical senses only show us a three-dimensional universe. What exists in the higher dimensions are entities we cannot touch with our physical senses. Exactly. So, the idea that we just operate in isolation of everything else is, for me, uh, crazy. So, like I say, I'll cut to the chase. This reality that we're experiencing has been hijacked by a force that some ancient people called archons, but there's different names right across the ancient world, for the same force, the same entities. This is when the penny drops, when all these different names for the gods all over the world turn out to be different names for the same force, because they're described in the same way. And um, all over the world you see this. Uh, in. Um, the Far East, Central America, and other places, they're known as the serpent gods. The Zulus call them the Chittahuri, the children of the serpent. They're the Anunnaki in, uh, in Suma, Babylon, now Iraq. There are snake brothers to the Hopi people of um, North America. They're the star people, many, many uh, examples of that. They are the demons of Christianity. To the Gnostics, they are archons. And to the Islamic and pre-Islamic world, they're called the jinn. And in their prime form, they are energetic uh, in, in nature, but they can take form, as I will talk about. So, like I say, they're described so much in the same way, because they, they're different names for the same thing. So, the uh, Gnostic people, uh, not the Christian Gnostics, the pre-Christian Gnostics, that ran the Great Library at Alexandria, and they also manifested as the Cathars in southern France, they say that the archons are made from luminous fire. The jinn, according to Islamic and pre-Islamic uh, belief, are made from smokeless fire. And you see this correlation of description um, wherever you go. Now, this, for me, was one of the great finds ever in terms of understanding the nature of what is happening. At Nagamadi in um, Egypt, about 77 miles north of, of Luxor on the Nile, in 1945, a sealed jar was found with loads and loads of documents in it, leather-bound. And they told um, the beliefs and the perceptions of this people called the Gnostics. And the Gnostics um, had a completely different um, view of reality than religion, which is why the Roman Catholic 
church and the Roman church tried to destroy them wherever they got um, any strength and any foothold. They ran the great library at Alexandria, which had something like half a million scrolls uh, detailing the beliefs of the ancient world and the, the history of the ancient world, destroyed um, by the Roman church. And like I say, the Cathars, who were destroyed again by the Roman church in 12... Uh, 44, I think it was, at, uh, at uh, uh, that uh, place in France, Montségur, that fort on the hill where I've been a couple of times. The religious establishment wanted these people destroyed because they were dangerous, because they had the truths they didn't want the people to know about. And um, this is what these scrolls um, and this find at Nagamadi said. One-fifth of the texts, and there were lots of them, were about a force called, they called the Archons, which they, they say created our physical universe, and they equated them with the Judeo-Christian Yahweh Jehovah God. And when you see the Old Testament Q 